Hi, I'm Patty McCord. I'm really glad to be here. I know it's the end of your conference, so uh, you only have to pay attention for 25 minutes, so it's an easy one. Um, and since we're small, let's do as much interaction as you want. If you want to interrupt me or you want to ask about something, feel free to do that because I don't, it's more fun for me to have some interaction than to just talk to you. But um, what I wanted to talk to you about today is not about academics and not about um, learning and development per se. I want to talk about the opportunity that I got to do at Netflix to create a really different kind of culture and how that came about and how I think about it. But I've been gone for six years and I do a lot of this right now. I talk to a lot of different companies and I found that some of the things that we did and tried turn out to be really good ideas and some of the things that we all do the same that we call best practices are really bad ideas. So I'm gonna, if you're in HR, prepare for me to lecture you a little bit. Um, but, <laughs> but I'm doing it with love. So I started out my career as a recruiter. I think it changes who I am because here's what we recruiters know. Um, we don't care if somebody leaves because that means that we get to hire somebody new. Uh, and we also know that there's no, nobody's indispensable and everybody can be replaced and it's a good idea to move on. So before we get started, Raise your hand if you're in the job you had when you graduated from college. Two out of you. I just did it with 1,500 people, the number was two. Okay, so, um, so let's start with retention. Like, so the rest of you work for really crappy companies that couldn't retain you. So what I wanna think about, just as a baseline premise, is that our careers are journeys and they last our whole lives, and I think that we can do each other, and particularly the students and the young people that we're working with, a big favor by not promising that companies are here to take care of you. So I called my book and I call my talk Power, Not Empowerment, because empowerment is one of those HR words that really makes me gag like you're empowered, because <laughs> what, we got the magic wand? Um, the reason we have to empower people is because we took it all away. So people walk in the door with power. Um, imagine that if you're one of those people that's worried about keeping risk from your company. You know, whenever you get to work Monday or whenever you go back to work, if you're in a parking lot or on the subway, I want you to look around and go, yep, everybody in this parking lot's here to sue me. Because they're not. Right? And here's another thing. Um, you know, I sometimes say, you know, has anybody ever done a layoff? And if it's an HR group, you know, 1,500 people raise their hands. And I said, have you ever laid off a family member? And there's always one person who has. I don't know why they hired their sister, but they shouldn't have. Um, but then I say, how many of you have used the word family at work in the last three months? And usually about half the audience raises their hand. And that's another one of those really bad misconceptions that I think gets us in a lot of trouble as leaders and managers. You are not a family, you're a team. And the team that you serve, the reason you're together as a team is to serve the people that use your product or your service. And there's, they are the people you're working for, not your internal departments inside of the organization. So I want to tell you a story about a team that I, I so I'm with a lot of coaches. Nowadays, when I'm on like the speaking thing, so I have to tell you my, um, my Canada story. It's a hockey story. It's for Brad. He's a hockey guy. I get invited to go do a talk in Canada, in Montreal in February, at the Bell Center in Canada. Anybody been to Montreal in February? It's so cold. So, so I call my daughter. I'm like, hey, honey, I'm going to Montreal in February. She's like, get a puffy coat. Go to Patagonia. Get a puffy coat. Get it now. OK, so I realize that it is colder than it can be in Canada. So I get a hotel where I can go underground. So I go underground to this venue, and um, they say at the last minute, hey, by the way, you're going to be on stage with um, this guy, Scotty Bowman. He's the winningest coach in the National Hockey League, right? And I think, well, that's pretty cool. That'll be fun. So I walk up on stage, and, and I'm with him in the green room underneath, and he looks at me and he goes, we're under the ice. And then I realize, we're in a hockey stadium. Like how, I'm used to groups like this, right? So I walk up on stage and there's like 
there's spotlights on me. My face is on the jumbotron. <laughs> like, oh! <laughs> but I'm cool. I, I, have this, I have this thing that you in HR know how to do. I have Botox face. <laughs> right? That face you use when somebody in an interview tells you something insane, and you go, oh, tell me more. <laughs> oh, mm, very interesting. You pulled the wings off flies as a child. Fascinating. Okay, so we get on stage, and so I go up, and they're like, this is Patty McCord, and everybody claps politely, and I go sit on my little couch, and then he walks up, and it's Scotty Bowman, and I mean, people are clapping like this, right? He's the winning, I'm in a hockey stadium in Canada. He's the winning, it's, people are like, if they had those foam fingers, they would have been waving them, right? They're taking selfies with him. He's this little 70-year-old guy in an ill-fitting suit, you know? He's got like a, a, lay, a maple pin and an American flag. So he sits down, the moderator says, uh, Mr. Bowman, you've coached all the greats, you've won so many tournaments, you've won so many games, what's your secret to success? How do you give the people on your team feedback to achieve the, what they've done? And he says, we pay an 80-game season, and every 10 games I sit down with each player. They do an evaluation. I do an evaluation. I look at all their stats. We look at who we're going to play in the next 10 games. We talk about all the other members on the team, the stuff that we've been working on, what it's going to take for us to win the next game. And I go through that with every person on the team every 10 games. Moderator says to me, Patty McCord, they say you hate the annual performance review, and I do. I think it's an utter waste of time. But the moderator says, but you never said what you would do instead. And I said what he said. <laughs> so think about it, right? We sometimes get a little, as leaders, as HR people, as learning people, we tend to be pretty insular. And we think that we surround ourselves with all the people that have all the answers, and we don't. And I walked away thinking, wow, that's a great feedback system. So if you do an annual performance review at your company, I, all I am asking you to do is to step away from it for one minute and say, why do we do this? What's the purpose of it? If it's a feedback system, it's really crappy, right? Name one other thing you do once a year that you're good at. That'd be nothing. Right? And you know how people are like, well, you know, I can't give them negative feedback because it's so hard. It's not hard. You know, it takes practice. So, you know, if that's what the reason why you say that you do it, it's a really lousy way to do it, and everybody knows it. If it's a way to set your compensation system, and you use a salary review that, you know, salary survey that you buy from a third party that you use to secretly determine compensation in a back room somewhere, and you tell employees to trust you, like, and you wonder why they're cynical when they don't really understand how the mechanics work for you to pay them. So that's what I'm asking you to do. I, my talk today is to have you walk away from here and say, okay, if I'm going to be part of creating a winning team in the organization that I'm in, am I doing everything that I can to make a difference in making sure that that team is a winning team? And that's about talent, right? And I think it's partly because I'm a recruiter, but I, I just did a talk at Glassdoor with a whole bunch of recruiters in San Francisco, and I said, um, how many of you guys uh, recruit for software engineers? You know, they all raise their hand because it's a bunch of geeky people in Silicon Valley. And I said, so how many of you have sat down next to somebody while they write code? Right? So talent is about understanding two really important things. Where's your company going? What's it look like? So here's my methodology. It's in the book, but it's pretty straight up. In six months, if you build a team, that is amazing. Not a, not a little better, not more, but amazing. a f -ing amazing, right? And that team is just blowing everybody away. It's your team, it's your company, whatever it is. What's occurring in six months then that's not occurring now? One of the things we often do is we say someday, and employees don't know, do you mean tomorrow afternoon or do you mean three years from now? So that's why I say t time wrapper, in six months if that team is amazing. What's occurring then that's not occurring now? Give me all your numerals if you have them. It's more, it's more revenue, it's more customers, they say, whatever that is, right? Because you probably all have that. 
And if you don't, someone in your organization does. And then make a movie of it. What's happening differently? Are there more meetings? Are there less meetings? Are people like standing up for their convictions and making hard decisions? Are people measuring what they're doing? Are people just heads down and working? And when I talk to CEOs about this, you can see the, the levers in their head, right? They're like, oh yeah, it would look like this. It would be like, we'd be on time, right? Now you drop down and say, okay, I can see this. I can see this vision of amazingness on this team, this winning team. What would people need to know how to do in order to do that? Well, you might need somebody on the team that doesn't just go, I don't know what they're doing in marketing, it's just they're insane, who instead says, oh, let me go ask them in marketing why they're doing it, because it sure seems insane. And they go find out and come back. That's a different person than the person that complains about it, right? So now I need to know, what do you need to know how to do in order to accomplish that? Then you drop down and say, okay, what kind of skills and experience would it take in order to know how to do that, in order to accomplish that in that time frame? Right? Then and only then, who do you got? Because if you start with who you got and you're going to coach them to be better, they will be better, but they may not be amazing. And when you have that conversation with people about what the team is going to look like in six months, if it's significantly different than the makeup of the team, I am telling you that it's humanly possible to go, I love you, man. We wouldn't be here without you. You're incredible. We don't need you anymore. Because you know how you hire people to do stuff sometimes and then they do it? Then it's done. Then you gotta find something else for them to do. So you find something else for them to do that they're not great at. And then they're cranky. You may use my algorithm for success. I use the word algorithm because I work with geeks and they like words like algorithm. It's like, it's a mathematical formula. Is what you love to do that you're extraordinarily good at doing something we need someone to be great at. So when you come across that cranky employee who's pouty because you've put them in a job that they can do but they don't love it because they're builders and you're done building it, right? then the issue is not that they're not performing. So let's think about performance for a sec. right? Okay, so when you hire somebody who doesn't have the skills to do the job and they suck and they fail, that is not their fault, that's yours. You hired the wrong person. That's your interview process. You failed in the interview process. That person is completely blameless. So the last thing you want to do if you made that terrible mistake is try and make that person successful when you know that you made a mistake and they're the wrong person. That's called, I'm sorry, we tried. Now, here's what you can do in an interview process. You can say, you're close and we love you and you got so much energy and you care so much about the project, but it's iffy whether or not you're gonna succeed. So we're willing to take the risk if you are. And if I say that in the interview and six months later it doesn't work out, then I don't have to prove in a performance improvement plan that you failed. I can say, we tried, right? So one of my big ahas when I was at Netflix was I wanted, because I had done another company with Reed with the CEO of Netflix, and this time I wanted to create the kind of company that would be a great place to be from. I wanted us to be like one of those iconic companies, like what if you were like from Apple or, you know, or Google or something like that. And when I did that, the day I woke up and said, that's what I want to be, I want to create a company that's a great place to be from, everything changes. Right? Now I don't care about retention. I care that you walk away having accomplished something that matters because those of us who hire people know that your future success is based on the people that you work with and the stuff that you accomplish, right? So, you, know, you know how you interview people and they're like, yes, I'm a senior vice president, super guru, hunga bunga. This, if you ever interview people from Microsoft, they always have these titles that are seven words long. You know, this is really important, my title at Microsoft. I'm like, okay, well, we don't care. Um, but, but, the, but those titles don't matter if they don't match the job that you need to get done, the problem that you need to get solved. And so that's, this, my algorithm will help you figure out how to have the right teams in place. And it will also help you figure out your own career. So when you wake up in the morning and you don't want to go to work anymore, something's up. 
right? Maybe, maybe you really love to do something and you're like, every day you think, if they only knew what I'm capable of, if they only cared what I could accomplish, and the truth is they don't, they don't care that you want to be a novelist. They don't care that you, right? It's not important to you. You finish that, you don't need that anymore. So those conversations with people, the reason I'm talking to you this way is you can have these conversations. They're not cruel. One of the things about my book that I was surprised at is um, I'm a big fan of radical honesty and candor. And most, I get a lot of interviews uh, with journalists who read it and they think I mean, be mean. Right, tell people these horrible truths, right? Be nasty to them. And, and the, our need for being nice outweighs our need for being truthful. And my experience is people can hear anything if it's true. And what makes people um, cranky and cynical and mean <laughs> is when you lie to them or you spin it. Well, you know, you did do that, but now it's not so great. You know, we're going to have to, I'm not sure you're our, um, there's issues. <laughs> and the person, and you're sitting there going, what the hell is she talking about? Right? Instead of just being truthful and telling the person what's up. And I don't mean, uh, when I talk about talent, I don't mean not giving great people opportunities. I'm all about that. I think that's a wonderful thing to do. And we should do that all the time. But we need to make the time to do that by getting rid of the time that we spend on people who shouldn't be there anymore, right? Just think about all the time you'd have back. I, I go on these rants about bonus programs, right? Like you talk to people who have these complex OKRs that roll up and roll down and you know the bonus system takes months to administer and then you have to renegotiate it all the time. And then I say to these companies, so do you ever not pay? the performance bonus? Well, yeah, I mean, we have not paid them. Really? Who, who hasn't gotten one? Well, they don't work here anymore. I'm like, well, why don't we just pay them? And then if they're not performing, they don't work there. I just call me crazy. I don't, I don't think cash incentives motivate people. I, I mean, what do you guys think? It's not been my experience. The people who are into their jobs and they care about what they're working on and they care about great results are going to do it anyway. Sure. So you just mentioned OKR. So yeah. you know, one of the things that I, I think is always challenging is like connecting you know, goals and, and sort of turning those down and motivating them and ultimately getting into like well what am I doing and how do I Yeah. The so how do you think about that? Uh, I think OKRs and goals and objectives are really, really important. And I think it's really critical that every person understands where they sit in the machine that makes the company successful on behalf of the customer. I think it's really important. I think we spend inordinate amounts of time on the process instead of just doing the work, <laughs> right? So I think that the more we can get better at really crisply articulating what success looks like, so that people know that this is what we're going to deliver. Here's our time frame. We're going to deliver it. Here's what quality looks like. Here's what it's going to result in. Then when you're really, really, really clear about that, then people can make good calls and go do that, right? And we overcomplicate it, right, because of all that rolling up and rolling down. So now are we really caring about delivering or are we caring about the process? Right, so that's where, that's how I feel about it. I think goals are really critically important and I think humans love to, pro the other thing is, I've found in the really complex like waterfall processes, they get watered down by the time you get to the individual contributor. And so now we're not, you know, people ask me a lot, how do you get HR people to operate like you do? I'm like, well, you expect more. People perform to expectations. You guys all know that, right? I always say to people, like, if you expect mediocrity, that's what you get. But if you expect excellence, you'll be surprised even from mediocre people, <laughs> right? So that's where I think if we were better at saying, here's the bar, get there. Let me know if you need any help. Let me know what's holding you back. Make sure we know that we have enough input to make that make sense. Then I think they're super powerful. Yeah, what was your question?
Okay, let's do that one. Here's my, I'm a recruiter, 100 years of recruiting. Here's what a job description is. It is either A, a description of somebody who left that you wish hadn't, B, a description of a fantasy person that doesn't exist, <laughs> or C, whatever it takes to get the wreck approved. Am I right? If instead we said, I, I talked to somebody earlier about it when I was doing book signing. I think recruiting is all about the prep. It's like painting, right? So you need to know what the team should look like, where the skills gaps are, what you're going to accomplish, what the time frame is, what the problem looks like, who loves solving that problem. You've got to get deep inside the kind of people that love solving that kind of problem. And when you start with the problem and you hire somebody to solve it, two things happen. One of them is you, you start caring less about five plus years of progressive experience coding in whatever language. And you start saying, wow, I really want somebody who's different than the people I have on my team because I, we haven't solved it, right? Which is going to open you to more diverse candidates. Because typically, back to my remember, I'm going to hire somebody who's smart, quick in their feet, decisive, intelligent, just like me. Preferably me 10 years ago, because I don't want the competition. <laughs> and that's how we get the way we get. Like hires, like hires, like hires, like hires, like. And then we go, where's the diversity? Right? So the diversity starts with the diverse ways of solving a problem, and then you're going to be open to more people to do it. So that means, so back to OKRs, I'm a big fan of pushing all that stuff locally. Right? So that should happen at the manager level. The teams themselves should figure out what those teams should look like. Recruiters are not resume givers. So um, I was tell, I'll tell the story I told Brad today. So I was a great recruiter. I recruited software engineers, technical engineers in the Silicon Valley. And uh, they're a special breed of human. Uh, they have very interesting habits that are very specific. Like, they like weird ethnic food in strip malls in Cupertino. So I would go to the Thai restaurant that was the hot Thai restaurant of the week. And on the table, so this is back in the day before we all had phones, I mean, cameras on our phones, right? Before we could carry our phones around. And, you know, they have the big fish bowl with all the business cards you put in for free lunch. And I would just take the fish bowl. <laughs> and the waitress would say, like, no, no, you can't do that. I'm like, oh, bring me pad Thai. It's fine. And I would write down everybody's number, and then I'd go back and call them. I go back to my office on my office phone column. And I tell people, you know, that's why God gave us LinkedIn now. We all have a fishbowl. So recruiting is the job of everyone in the company all the time. That's why if you can be articulate about what those problems to solve, what it's going to look like, what the team's going to look like, then, you know, I tell people in the Silicon Valley, most fertile recruiting uh, venue, kids' soccer games. So what is it you do? Oh, you should come talk to me. We called it at Netflix, we called it ABR and always be recruiting. And by the way, when your employees see your CEO interviewing somebody three times a week for their job, <laughs> right, then you're going to see that we're constantly looking for talent. So you have to have, that pipeline isn't like, oh shit, we're screwed, we got to hire somebody, John left. It's like, wow, who, where are the four other Johns in case he gets an opportunity somewhere else? Um, yeah? Back to this question, I'm, I'm wondering, like, do you have a situation where an employee is really great, they're really talented, but maybe their personal ambitions are no longer aligned with the role that they're in right now, or there's not a skill fit, right? Like, you often want to keep them with the company if possible, if there is a fit elsewhere. I'm just wondering if you have any well, if there's a fit elsewhere that they're, uh, they're into, then that's perfectly reasonable. But A, I just, I just told you, first you want a talent pipeline that happens all the time, so you're not completely dependent on keeping that person. Secondly, if an amazing person has an incredible opportunity that you can't give them because you gave them the opportunity to have that, then you should be proud of that and celebrate that. Right? Um, I've, I just this morning on uh, Facebook, uh, an ex-Netflix executive that I worked with is going back. She's been gone for eight years. 
and she's going back. And so she is a way better executive now than she was then because of her experience at another company. So, you know, I, that, that's keeping them stuff. They're going to resent it, right? And you just got to be honest. Uh, like the person, you know, the ones that like, okay, here's my checklist to be a director, and I'm 39, and I'd like to be a director by the time I'm 40, or life as I know it will be over, right? And so, and then you scramble around to find a role for them to be a director. Mm -mm. You either need one or you don't. Right? And I say, if, that, if life as you know it is going to be over, then you should go somewhere else and do it. So I mean, that's the great place to be from stuff. If the, the way to keep people is keep them engaged in the work that they're doing. Right? Are they surrounded by a great team doing stuff? And sometimes when you get done, it's time to think about other stuff. I encourage people to interview. So I'm at Transformation, which is my last slide. I, it's a short time frame here. She's red carding me, cut, cut, cut. So what I want you to do in terms of transforming your organization is I want you to go away and I want you to do a couple things. I want you to look at something that you're doing every week from now on and ask yourself why you do it. And I want you to consider the most innovative thing you can do in your organization. Stop. So I never did anything at Netflix that was new and crazy and wonderful and weird. What I did was throw away stuff that didn't matter anymore. So I want to leave you with that, that that is a tool that I learned from people who innovate. No, no innovator ever says, huh, I want to solve this gnarly problem. Let's see what everybody else is doing and call it best practices. You start with the problem that you want to solve, and you work your way back. And so thank you for listening to my talk.